The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, you have a checkered garter snake, and that's a common snake in this area, and they love to eat frogs. I thought we were gonna have a hard time finding cats to catch in these really urban spots, but there's no shortage of bobcats. Generally, people are coming out here just to go to the beach, whether it's for swimming, fishing, surfing, windsurfing, stuff like that. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. My name is Don Cash, and I'm one of the producers for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Show. Here we go. I spend most of my working hours holed up in a dark edit room putting the shows together. But that doesn't mean I never get to go out and enjoy any actual real nature. As a matter of fact, when I leave here and head home, I've got my own little nature preserve waiting for me. This is my frog pond. The pond got started about 10 years ago. We dug a hole in the ground, put in a liner, stacked some rocks, installed a filter, and added a dozen or so goldfish. Now, the goldfish are really nice, but the pond attracts other animals as well. Every spring, it seems like every frog in the neighborhood hangs out here. It's pretty neat. I wanted to know what kind of frogs they are and why I have so many, so I brought in an expert. You know, what's really neat is that you basically had to drive a chunk of dirt and you built a pond. When you build a fish pond, you can expect other wildlife to show up. Birds will come and drink and bathe. Frogs will show up and breed and feed. And then snakes and other predators may show up and feed on those frogs. Pretty cool. Here's a sign of a happy, healthy frog population. This is a whole mass of frog eggs right here. It's really nice. You create a little oasis here. Well, what kind of frogs do I have here? What do you see? These are Rio Grande leopard frogs, and uh, you have all sizes. That frog right there is one of the biggest Rio Grande leopard frogs I've ever seen. This is probably the prime watering hole for frogs in your neighborhood. The nearest natural water to my house is a creek about three miles away, but somehow frogs and toads manage to find their way here. Now, I don't know the difference between frogs and toads, but I do know that a couple of years ago, the pond was taken over by a whole bunch of very noisy Gulf Coast toads. So how do they know this is here? That's a good question. How do frogs know a pond is here? Part of it is random chance frogs finding it, but also once a frog finds it and there's a male calling, other frogs are gonna be attracted to that. One male calling isn't enough to attract females to that site to breed. Once you get several males, they'll change their calls and they work together and form a chorus. And that's much more attractive to females. In the spring, when it's really busy, the pond becomes sort of a frog buffet. Uh, you have a checkered garter snake, and that's a common snake in this area, and they love to eat frogs. Yeah, I've noticed that when the snakes are around, the frogs manage to stay very still. First line of defense is to avoid detection. So if the frogs uh, can't easily escape or it's not necessary, they'll just freeze up and, and hope that the snake notices someone else. You don't have to be the fastest frog. Yeah, they're hoping someone else moves first. <laughs> a couple of things to note about my pond. These elephant ear plants aren't native. We got them from someone else's fish pond and they will not go away. 
And the goldfish? They came from the pet store. But since my pond is a self-contained ecosystem, there's no real danger that the plants or the fish are gonna cause a problem elsewhere. It's important to uh, go native, stay local, encourage what you've got in your neighborhood. Uh, certainly don't uh, introduce exotic or non-native species to Texas, and uh, just be patient. If there are frogs in your area, they'll find your pond. And so the frogs find my pond year after year, and I like that. Best frog pond you've ever seen? It's epic. The most amazing nine square meters in southwestern Travis County. I think that's pushing it. Julie Gulla is a graduate student. When she is home, she looks after a house cat. But when she leaves home, it's often because another kind of cat is calling. The allure of cats and their strength and their stealth. They're pretty fascinating. Julie is studying bobcats. And where she is finding them might surprise you. With Texas Parks and Wildlife, Julie is researching these wild cats in between urban Dallas and Fort Worth. We're hoping to answer some very basic questions about urban bobcats, something that we know very little about. Watch out! We do know a decent amount about them in rural areas. There's been a number of bobcat studies here in Texas, but nothing urban. Wow. We're genuinely looking at an area that is completely encompassed by human development. We're looking at how bobcats move in the city areas. It started out with cameras. Cameras have been very important, not only to see the number of animals, but also to find those hot spots where we can catch them in a quick and efficient manner. We've gotten quite a few bobcats on camera. Let's see what we got. On trails that we do get bobcat traffic, that's where we'll put our trap. Possum, armadillo, and then another bobcat walks by. I thought we were gonna have a hard time finding cats to catch in these really urban spots, but there is no shortage of bobcats, and I think people will be surprised. When they're developing a golf course, they don't realize that the strip of trees between fairways is serving as a corridor for wildlife, but it works quite well for us. In Euless, all around the Texas Star Golf Course, wildlife corridors are identified. Then, the real intensive work begins. Between seven to 10 traps, are open at once. Um, with one person running a trap line, I can't do much more than that. And we've been trapping for about 10 weeks. That's good. Julie is no stranger to catching carnivores. She has worked with mountain lions and wolves in other states. But baiting for bobcats has its own challenges. The trouble is when you put a lot of scent down, a lot of stinky, nasty stuff, and then you're crawling on your belly. <laughs> Odors only go so far. Like a rain. Oh, yeah. Attracting bobcats requires some cat psychology. You know, they're like house cats. They're curious. They like smells. They like feathers. They like furry, shiny stuff. And if they see something move, it's going to catch their attention. Fortunately, I can use that to my advantage. Making cat lures isn't exactly glamorous. We're all about recycling. Fresh ones. I don't do rotten roadkill. But there is plenty of evidence that the custom cat toys work. It's batting at it. That's awesome. <laughs> you can tell this one's got it, and then it lets go, and it's probably flinging around. Mm -hmm. Of course, getting a cat's attention and getting it to enter a trap are different things. Bobcats are smart, wary, and rarely seen. Just ask someone who works where a cat can be seen daily. Bobcats are about twice the size of your typical house cat. They are native, but people don't usually see them because they're most active when a lot of people are either just getting up or they're going to bed for the night, but they are out there. They're named the bobcat for their short little bobbed tail and uh, just so curious. You can just tell that they're constantly thinking. Those are just a lot of nice natural funnels. Mm -hmm. Derek and Julie must be so constantly excited. thinking as well. Monitoring cameras, moving traps, and freshening baits. I can put fresh raw meat, squirrel meat, rabbit meat in a trap and they still won't go in just because it's like, meh. 
I'm just gonna go eat my own squirrel. They're not food motivated typically just because they're so good at what they do. So that's where it comes into like just keying in on their curiosity. It may seem curious that a carnivore could even make a living in this kind of landscape. Oh yeah, that's Euless Avenue, so that's another oh, color. Wow, track. eight o'clock at night, mm -hmm. cars moving by, just doesn't even care. Mm -hmm. The number of cats photographed in a hurry. suggests they are finding enough to eat. The rats, the mice, the squirrels, the rabbits, the really small fuzzy critters that may be quick to us, but not too quick for a bobcat. Between roads and buildings, green belts and watersheds connect hunting and hiding places. But exactly how cats use these habitats is not fully understood. And that is what this study is all about. The study area stretches from the edge of Fort Worth to Irving and Grand Prairie. GPS collars will store data about daily movements and ranges of individual cats for an entire year. But first, the cats must be captured. Some traps can send an alert when tripped, but Julie still checks every trap twice a day. Driving to check traps, literally a wild bobcat chase. Here we go. After 10 weeks of trapping, this road is due for a bobcat. 13 cats have been captured, a few too small for collars. Nine cats now wear the GPS loggers, but one more is needed for a full range of data. She's thinking about it. The pressure is on. Julie's friend Jim has come from Idaho to help trap for a week. I'm a wildlife biologist for the Nez Perce tribe. Julie and I worked on a wolf project up there. But so far, the trappers are plagued by a different animal. Oh, little possum. I'm just kind of convinced this guy to go on about his morning. The bar is closed. And there he goes. When you're trying to catch certain types of animals, you're always at the risk of catching bycatch species. Bye bye, dude. Don't come back. So I missed a cat last night because something fell on the door and made it close. But she got on top of the trap at one point, looking through the front of the trap. Maybe she'll come back and check it out again. The weather holds up. Ooh. Nothing. Capturing the animals. Awesome. Meeting your quota is your biggest fear at the beginning. Nothing's changed. Because you don't know what it's gonna be like. Unless somebody's done it before, we have no idea if it's possible or not. All right, nothing here. <sighs> I no longer have my camera on my tree. My trap has been messed with. Really sucks. Nothing's happening. Everything's come to a grinding halt, it seems. We're gonna get the podcast. We have to. I'm gonna go crazy. <laughs> awesome. I'm somewhat frustrated with possums at the moment. One. A one possum day. It's better than a stolen camera day. He was a wonderful good squirrel. A one in his crying. No, he looks terrible. Tracks? Those are bobcats. Well, there was probably a possum in the trap, so they couldn't go in. Hey. I don't know how much more of this I can even take. Always hope for tomorrow. I was hopeful that we'd catch at least one bobcat. Time's up for me. I have to leave this afternoon. Disappointing not to catch one, but I fully understand that that's how it goes. 4.52 p.m. I was just about ready to head out the door and I got a text, so I came to check the trap and sure enough, there's a bobcat in the trap right next to a very, very busy road right at rush hour. Derek is first on the scene. If I had to guess, I'd say it's a juvenile male. Looks like he's a healthy animal. Julie is just dropping Jim at the airport. Bobcat. But still happy for the news. 
<laughs> the crew is soon assembled. Yes! This would have been an excellent April Fool's Day joke. If it's a joke, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> but this time, it's no possum. Yeah, 16 pounds for him. The crew readies a sedative cocktail to be delivered with great care and an extra long syringe. And Derek's going to act as my decoy to kind of keep the cat facing him. Got him. It takes about five minutes for the drug to take effect, so we'll walk away and let him go down. So yeah, we'll wait until about 7.45. Yeah, good sleepy kitty. And we'll go to a much quieter location, not only for us, but also for the bobcat. Because even though they're, they're down and immobilized, they can still hear the boy. They can still sense light and fast movement that can make their heart rate faster. So we want to keep things as calm and quiet as possible throughout the capture. All good. Thank you kindly, sir. So he's not able to blink right now. So this is just artificial tears. The cat is thoroughly looked after while being thoroughly weighed, measured, and documented. 7.5. Some of these cats have a lot of spotting, almost leopard-like. Um, but yeah, these arm bars, that's how we identify them. They're very easy to see in nighttime photos, so that's what we get pictures of. Okay. You want to get good, solid information, because this is a lot of work that goes into every bobcat we catch. We're very excited and happy that we're adding another member to our research group. Uh, the fact is, we still have a job to do, and, and we don't take it very lightly. As night falls, additional data is gathered, but not only for their study. This is for parasitology, this is for disease, this is for genetics, this is for rodenticide. Getting a lot of information from these bobcats. But for Julie and Derek's research, hey, kitty. fitting the tracking collar is the most important step. In a year, when we get that collar back, it could potentially be giving us 3,500 locations. Perfect. All right, he's kind of waking up. Down. It's always stressful doing this because you take the animal's well-being in your hands when you work with them like this, but we did everything right and, and everything went really well. He's doing great right now. It's relieving to see that the animal is, is coming out in great shape. I'll just give him like 20 minutes. Last cat captured and collared. Excellent day. Having good days like today makes me know that we can get the most out of this effort. I didn't even do the thermometer, okay? I think he's good. Four and a half months after the release, Bobcat B-14 and most of the study's cats can be regularly located by the radio beacons on their collars. But not all. We did have a cat. She lived off of a six lane street and she ended up getting hit by a car. We're sad to have lost a bobcat, but it's such valuable information in our study, so we can learn about the challenges that these cats overcome and sometimes don't overcome when it comes to living in an urban landscape. But two more cats have also gone missing. All right, everybody ready? And taking to the sky holds the best hope for finding them. Our main objective is to locate these missing animals, but a secondary goal is to find out where they are not. Flying is a little bit more expensive than it is on the ground, but one flight can save you weeks of ground effort. Within half an hour of takeoff, there is good news. Yeah, he's definitely in here. Cool. He's even back there. I can already hear nothing, nothing, nothing. Cool. One of the two cats is found just beyond his last known location. Oh, yeah. Well, that's awesome. We'll go check up on him later today and just see what he's doing. Within the week, the second missing cat is spotted on a trail camera. The radio beacon has stopped working, but the collar is still intact. When you strap electronic equipment to a wild animal, you're never quite sure how that's going to hold up. It's definitely that way. 
I can't track him with my telemetry equipment anymore, but I can still try and monitor his presence with these cameras and we can hopefully try and recapture him and remove the collar ourselves. It will be months before the remaining collars drop off and reveal new secrets about the lives of urban bobcats. But the study is already shedding new light on how their habitats overlap with ours. He was about here. Yeah. But he was also spotted about here. Mm -hmm. Like we've got cats sleeping under roadways. They're hunting on golf courses. We're finding that bobcats are in neighborhoods on a daily basis, and people rarely see them and rarely have problems. If you see a bobcat, don't approach it or try to feed it. As long as we respect them as wild animals, we can continue to share this space with wildlife. They're here. They're valuable. They are excellent critters, and to strive in an urban environment, that's incredible. come out to the island, they're looking for relaxation. So the minute they, they get here, they get set up, that's all they're looking to do, just sit back, relax, take it at their own pace. In Texas, I don't think a lot of people realize within hours you can be here. And when you sit out in, in this breeze coming off the water, it's just great. Just minutes from Corpus Christi, there's a state park that's a beachgoer's paradise. Generally, people are coming out here just to go to the beach, whether it's for swimming, fishing, surfing, windsurfing, stuff like that, or just to go for a stroll and spend some time with the kids on the beach. Well, these guys have just been happy because there's so many other kids here and they're playing and they're seeing new stuff. I think that's the biggest draw is that they're, they're something for all of us. I mean, we like to hang out and just sit on the beach and as you can see, they're tearing it up, playing and surfing, so it's good. And if you look down along the shoreline, you'll see plenty of birds. This coastal barrier island is big for birding. Oh, wow. Mostly out here, people are coming to get the shore birds. Look at them go, look at them go, wow. The things you're only gonna see out on the Gulf beaches and maybe in the tidal flats on the backside of the island. If you can see them in the scope, moving to the right right now, and that's a snowy. This is great. So if you look at this guy that's feeding in the water, wow. those are black neck stilts. How lovely. What a very elegant looking bird. While some like to watch birds, kite surfers fly like them. There's room for everybody, nice big beaches, and there's just miles of wide open waves down there. I mean, it's, it's an amazing spot. We love it. For kite surfers, birders, or beach bums, Mustang Island State Park is worth a visit. You know, that surf at night, hearing that rolling, it put you right to sleep, so it's beautiful for camping and relaxing.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.